This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. Hi, guys. Today, we got a return guest to the show. His name is Stephen Pressfield. He is the author of historical fiction, nonfiction, and screenplays. His first book went super, super mega viral. It was The Legend of Bagger Vance, which was later turned into a movie that was directed by Robert Redford, and it starred Will Smith, Charlize Theron, and Matt Damon. His second book was Gates of Fire which is about the Spartans at the Battle of Thermopylae. And the book is on our list of 100 books every modern Christian man should read list. It is an absolute classic, but those aren't his only classics. He has some other ones, a new classic that he just added recently, which is A Man at Arms, but he also wrote The War of Art, Turning Pro, Do the Work, The Warrior Ethos, Tides of War, and literally over a dozen other books. He's a very, very prominent author. He's been on episodes 151 and 182 of this podcast. In this podcast, we talk about a new book, a new nonfiction book that he has that really tries to encourage guys to to actually do the work. And I know he's written a book called Do the Work, but giving guys a little bit more tangible knowledge in these bite-sized little chapters of how they can force themselves to do these things. Because again, in this episode, we talk about the difference between you know discipline and motivation. We talk about the muse, you know, and we get into kind of a deep conversation. I pressed him a few times on the muse and how he actually prays to the muse and what does that mean, especially within the context of a Judeo-Christian ethic or a Christian worldview that I uh, that I have. But we talk about so many uh, amazing things in this particular interview. And the thing about his book and about his style, even during podcasting, is there are there are little nuggets. There are little sticky nuggets of facts that will help you to just do the things that you know you need to do. Because he even said in the interview, like there are times whenever you're just, you know, the hard thing is the thing that will lead you to a good thing. But a lot of us choose to not do that. Even at one point in the interview, he kind of turned it around on me and he asked me a couple of questions. So I think you guys will enjoy that. But I always enjoy my time with Stephen Pressfield. He is one of our favorite guys to talk to on the show. And every time he has a book that comes out, which is a couple of times a year, he will be coming back on. So guys, without further ado, let's get into it. Stephen Pressfield, welcome back to Undaunted Life of Man's podcast. Thank you, Kyle. It's great to be back. Thanks for having me. Hey, if you keep writing books, you know that you can just keep coming back on. I, th- I think this is your third appearance. So, you, you know, just keep churning them out. Okay. Well, then I'll be seeing you every six months because that's kind of the way it's going. Okay. Well, see, that's the thing is, and we're going to get into that today. Part of the reason why you're so prolific as a writer is because you actually do the work of writing, no pun intended for people that know your back catalog. But I did want to kind of start someplace because uh, I don't think I embarrassed you enough in the first two times you Uh appeared on the show that I want to, I want to make you a little sheepish from the very, very beginning because you're a humble guy. You, you like to deflect compliments and things like that. But your name comes up all the time in, in the mouths of some very, very prominent people. Joe Rogan will mention you once once a month or once every couple of months and mention your work. Jack Carr, obviously, who's having the biggest summer yeah, uh, possible, is, you know, he? with the yeah. re- with the release of his fifth novel and the release of the Terminalist series on Amazon and the re-release of the Terminalist book. Uh, I mean, he is about to be shoot off to the moon yeah, and yeah. he gives you a ton of credit and just about every opportunity he gets, he mentions Stephen Pressfield. So how does that make you feel? Like, let's dig in a little bit. You can, you can be a little bit cocky. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, maybe I am a humble guy, Kyle, because it, it somehow, or maybe this is a character flaw, but that certainly doesn't uh, go to my head in any way. You know, I mean, I'm I'm happy that uh, stuff I've done, you know, has influenced people in a in a positive way. Um, but uh, you know, it's always on to the next book and the next, you know, whatever the next challenge is, and are are you up for that one? You know, so. Uh, that's that's sort of the way I kind of, I don't know, judge myself or rate myself. But in any event, thanks for the very kind words. I appreciate it. I'm going to force you to talk about it a little bit further. Has there been a time, because because I'll say this, I'll, I'll put it in the context of me, which is a much, much smaller scale compared to you. But when someone sends me an email and they say, you know, hey, I'm 17 years old and your show has meant so much to me. I, I've grown so much as a young man. I started listening at the age of 15. I don't know what to do with that. And then I get a grown man in his 50s that's like, Kyle, I've been listening to your show and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a more focused husband. I'm doing better at work and I'm doing these things. And I'm like, I just remember, I'm just a dude that throws on a black t-shirt and hops in front of a microphone a few times a week. But I, the the impact I'm, I'm having and the impact that the show is having humbly 
is it, well, it is humbling to me. Like I, I say that humbly, but it is humbling to me because there are times when I'm like, man, I don't really want to record right now, or I don't really know if this stuff is landing, but it is landing. So have you had times like that either with someone that is prolific or maybe even someone to just write you an email or, or drops you a DM or comes up to you on the street where it's like, wow, I, I guess I am having a much bigger impact than I ever would have thought possible when I was, you know, trying to avoid going to Vietnam years and years and years ago. <laughs> you know, it's, it is humbling, I guess. Maybe, uh, um, maybe that's, that's the word, but, uh, you know, I think like, like Seth Godin, I know, you know, who he is, mm. he definitely, his agenda, as he says himself is to create change. You know, he really wants to get his ideas out there and change the world. But I don't know about you, but for me, like in books like the war of art or turning pro or the other books of mine that have had an effect, I'm really writing for myself, you know? Okay. It's it, my motivation. You know, I've heard people say, oh, you should as a writer, you should sort of imagine an avatar of your your typical reader and figure out what you're trying to address to them. But I don't do it that way. I'm just kind of writing for myself. I'm just trying to sort of express, you know, the, the sort of the world as I see it, the inner world as I see it. And if it helps people, that's great. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's it's humbling. I really don't know what to do with it. Well, I, I won't make you keep talking about it, but I will say that for me, like I'll get complimented off air and you, you've done so with me. You were one of the earliest people to compliment my interviewing style. And you know, that that's very awesome to hear from someone like you. But part of my interviewing style is I'm not necessarily, I'm thinking about what's interesting to me and what's exciting yeah. to me. Yeah. And what ends up happening is my listener, my end user of this podcast is like, yeah, I wanted to know that too. And every now and then I'll miss the mark and say, someone will say, you know, why didn't you ask them this? And why didn't you talk about this book or this quote or whatever? whatever. And that's fine. But like, I think about myself and I try to be inquisitive because I know my audience mirrors a lot of the same attitudes that I do. And if they don't, some of the best compliments I ever get are Kyle, I don't always agree with you, but, and whatever's after the, but I'm fine with, because that means they're still listening. They're still engaged. And so yeah. I think that's really, really important that if it's interesting to you, whenever you think about your audience, you know, air quotes, your audience, wouldn't you imagine that they would be reflecting something that, that yeah. you're trying to bring out in your work, right? Yeah. But it's the black T-shirt, Kyle. That's the thing. That's the key. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That, that's that's my calling card. And I people think I own, own. Yeah, see, <laughs> people think I own one shirt. It's like, guys, guys, like w they do make multiples of these shirts, and they do all fit me. But we do need to get into your new book because you've got a new book out, guys. If you're listening to this on time, it is out. It is available. It is in the show notes, so you can go and pick it up. So, if you would give us a thirty thousand foot overview of this new book that you wrote for us. Well, the new book is called Put Your Ass Where Your Heart Wants to Be. And it's in the same vein of as The War of Art or Turning Pro or Do the Work. And uh, But it, it comes at it from a slightly different angle. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it starts with uh, um, the idea of if you want to be a writer, you know, people say, oh, I want to be a writer. I want to be something. If you want to be a writer. Put your ass in front of one of these things, you know, <laughs> right. there's there's magic. If you want to dance, get into the studio. If you want to paint, get up in front of an easel. Right. So on and so forth. There's real magic in in physically moving your body to the place where your dream can come true. And then the book takes it on to into deeper levels and deeper levels than that until it becomes fairly spiritual, which we maybe we'll get into that a little bit as we yeah. talk today, Kyle. But the, yeah. the whole idea of taking your material person, your ego, your commitment, the stuff that's physical, that's in this world, and putting it in the place where your calling is, where your dream is, where the higher your higher self is, that's, if there's an answer, that's it, you know? And if there's a reason why we're on this planet, if you ask me, that's it too. Absolutely. And we will, we will 100% dive into some of those heavier topics, but to kind of stay, uh, say kind of hovering over the book a little bit, there's a couple of interesting things about this book. The, the first thing is that guys, when you get it, whether you get the digital version or the physical version, these are kind of short one page, uh, chapters. They're almost like journal entries. And so like this, 
I don't know that you necessarily should use it this way, but like if you if you're a bathroom reader, like you could you could get a couple <laughs> of chapters knocked out yeah, like toilet. of this book. <laughs> yeah, like uh, but but don't don't use it while you're on the toilet. Just like you <laughs> read it while you're on the toilet. But but also uh, my understanding is is this is your first kind of foray into self publishing. If I got that correct, so talk to me a little bit about why you wrote it the way that you did, and then why not putting out put it out with you know a publishing house which you've done for a couple of dozen books. Well, um, you know, when I first wrote The War of Art, which was like 20 years ago, hmm. it was a really a short book. At least it seemed at the time like a really short book. Now I look at it, it looks like War and Peace. It's like <laughs> so big and so long. And people's attention spans have shortened, you right. know. And so I don't know, the style that The War of Art was written in, which was in same sort of short, punchy paragraphs, I found to be exactly right for this kind of subject. And so I've kind of shortened them a little bit. And I don't mind at all having a par having a chapter that's three sentences long because I think something about this material, the material of digging into your own heart and finding where you're going, it lends itself to that sort of, um, I don't want to say parable style, but a, a really short thing that makes you think. You know, right. I would say about this book, like the war of art that you read a chapter, you got to kind of stop for a second, you know, and, and, and absorb it a little. It isn't something where you just flow, flow, flow. And as far as self publishing, I have had a company, uh, black Irish books mm -hmm. that published the war of art with, uh, with my partner, Sean coin, but, um, we've sort of gone in different directions. And so in order to keep publishing and keep control of it, uh, I've had to start my own little company again, and and that's what uh, put your ass where your heart wants to be is coming out under, and is also you know it's a it's a emblematic of that concept. Yeah, absolutely. One one word that I wrote down as you were describing the book, but also as I was reading it, is sticky. And so sometimes when you have a book that is so dense, like maybe you're reading a book about philosophy or even history or theology or something like that, it's like there's so much packed into these chapters and I'm kind of stupid. And so if it's a 10 page chapter or less, I love that book. But then you have these, these tomes, these 500 page books that are like four chapters and it's like, no, I can't possibly get through this entire thing, but the, it's so small and so bite-sized that these concepts do become a little bit sticky. And right from the beginning of the book, and this is helpful to anybody who maybe hasn't read some of your nonfiction, but you talk about resistance and that's capital R resistance. And really that's that's a through point. When Joe Rogan mentions you on his show, he almost always mentions Stephen Pressfield and resistance. Like he mentions that in the same breath. So talk to us a little bit for those that are not familiar with your work. What is capital R resistance? Uh, that's a great question. And I'm going to go back to, to this uh, graphic that I just showed a little bit. When you sit down, if you're a writer yeah. and you sit down in front of one of these things, he's holding up his keyboard, feel, gentlemen, he's holding it up. You feel radiating off of that keyboard a negative force that is like trying to stop you from doing your work, trying to make mm -hmm. you go to the beach, trying to make you go back to bed, trying mm -hmm. to make you give in to some kind of distraction. It's the same sort of principle as uh, if you've ever bought uh, a treadmill and brought it home and you find it collecting dust in the attic. Like, why is that happening? Right. Why, when you join a gym, do you find that you don't, it's hard to go, right? Because mm -hmm. there is a force, a negative force that I'm convinced is, first of all, I know it's universal because I've gotten thousands of emails from people writing into this thing. And in fact, I would say if there's any sort of quote unquote secret to, to, to life or to success, it's learning to overcome somehow that force of self-sabotage. I say it in the war of art, that the as a writer, the writing is not the hard part. What's hard is sitting down to write. And what keeps us mm -hmm. from sitting down is this negative force that I call resistance with a capital R. The thing that's interesting about putting it in those terms is a lot of people are fighting battles, but they haven't defined their enemy yet. So imagine being a country that's trying to fight your enemies and yet you can't name them. Like that kind of gets into the political world, which we'll stay out of for today. But that, that kind of reminded me of something from chapter 32 of your book, because you have a quote in chapter 32 from a physical trainer named T.R. Goodman, and it's, it's not habit, it's your life. 
And so that's come up for me in a lot of ways because people say like, hey, Kyle, what are you training for? Because I, I train a lot physically. I essentially work out every day. I work out really, really, really hard. That's that's kind of my self-torture, you know, and, you know, that's kind of like I tear myself down to build myself up. But it's always the difference between motivation and discipline. Before I got on here today, I did squat. I don't like doing squat. I don't like putting a whole bunch of weight on my back, squatting down below 90, and then coming back up and doing that over and over and over. And I work out in my garage gym, which is not temperature or climate controlled. It's already 100 degrees here in Oklahoma this morning, and you just deal with it. And if it was minus five degrees, you go out in the garage and you just deal with it. And it never has to do with motivation, Stephen, because if you wait for the motivation bug to bite you or to you know strike you uh, in the tip of your head, it's never going to work for you. Like how often are you so unbelievably motivated to sit down in front of a keyboard? But uh, like motivation is it's, it's part of this, this movement towards a self-helpy kind of new agey understanding of motivation. It's like, no, 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 you have to do the work. You have to force yourself to do the work, right? There seems to be a law of life that the things that are really good for you <laughs> hurt. All the right? time, right? You don't want to do them you, again. It's it's resistance. It's that capital R. That's what makes it hard, right? I'm a gym person too. I've been to the gym this morning. I've done my thing, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason I do it, I'm sure, is the same reason you do it. That it gets the day going because when I when I wake up in the morning, the my resistance hits me as soon as I open my eyes, right. you know the resistance to do the writing for today, doing whatever else it is. And so for me, physical exercise, again, when I say put your ass where your heart wants to be, that is the gym for me. Putting your physical ass there in the squat rack, wherever it is, and, and doing something you don't want to do gets that rhythm going gets the mojo going because you know that that's what you're going to have to do for the rest of the day is doing right. things you don't really want to do. On the other hand, if you did all day long, the things that you do want to do, you'd go into the toilet in a week and a half, you know, and right. a lot of people live that way. I remember uh, when Jordan Peterson was talking, he's mentioned this several times, but he's talked to people about their, their ideal life. And they always describe kind of the beach and, you know, pina coladas and that type of thing. And then he's basically like, okay, then after two weeks, what are you going to do? <laughs> like, like human beings need struggle, yeah. but you're absolutely right, Stephen. Like the moment my alarm goes off in the morning or I hear my son wake up or something like that, I think to myself in that exact moment, not I have to pee or, oh, look at all the stuff I have to do today. It's like, there's no way I'm going to be able to work out today. There's simply no way I'm not going to be able to physically get out of this bed and put on my clothes and go to the gym. And like, the thing is, is like my gym's not away from me. My gym is in my garage. And so I've done all I can to tell resistance to go pound sand because resistance is in your car keys and it's in your gas tank and it's in the, the commute to the gym and it's in the person that you don't like anymore that works out at the same time that you do all that's resistance. So I try to tell guys create as try to minimize the size of resistance as much as possible to kind of bring it down to size. And that means taking away those barriers to entry. And one of those things you talked about, and you kind of teed it up a little bit from the beginning for a lot of people, whether you're an artist or a content creator or an entrepreneur, there's a little bit of resistance in terms of where you're located. And so you talk about that in the book, you talk about how you might need to move to one of these hubs if, if you want to do a certain thing. So maybe there's a, the, the current hub for jujitsu is now Austin, Texas. Maybe if it's the, the arts like theater, maybe it's New York city. If it's, you know, uh, learning how to run cattle, maybe it's Wyoming. Like there's all these different hubs of things. But as soon as I read that, Steven, I got to be honest, I thought, is that actually true though? In this post-COVID world that we live in, this post-Zoom meeting for everything, look how you and I are connecting. We've never met in person, and yet this is our third time hanging out together over Zoom. So like, for a lot of businesses, do you actually have to move? Because I'm running this business from right in the middle of Oklahoma, and it seems to be going okay. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't think you actually do have to move, because in a way, metaphorically, because of the web, because of yeah. Zoom, because of Zencaster, you can make yourself in the hub of things just sitting right where you are. And also, another, there's another chapter in the book where I talk about Stephen King, who mm -hmm. lives in Maine and he lives in Sarasota, Florida, or right. uh, William Faulkner, who lived all his life in Oxford, Mississippi. And did they have to go to Paris? Did they have to go to some place like that? And the answer is, in a way, they were so committed 
and so true to their own heart that they, wherever they were, was like their own personal hotspot. Right. They brought that with them. So it really didn't matter. They could go down to Starbucks. Jack Carr is a great guy for doing his writing in the craziest places, you know, I mean, in coffee mm-hmm. shops and in, in airport waiting rooms. Somehow he's able to do that because he's so focused that he has his own sort of personal psychological hotspot that he produces. But I will also say that the idea of if you want to be a dancer, you want to be a ballet dancer. It sure makes sense to go to New York or to some place mm-hmm. where there are a number of ballet companies where you can get the training, where you can make friends and so on and so forth. But you're right. In the post-COVID world of Zoom and Zencaster, you can create your own your own Paris right where you are. And part of it, Stephen, is becoming undeniable. And so some people will talk about in terms of being uncancelable. So Joe Rogan's so big, he can't be canceled. So there's his third free mention on this show so far. <laughs> but like part of it is if you're so good at something, you can be undeniable. One of my mentors is a guy named John Eldridge. He wrote basically the seminal uh, Christian men's ministry book ever about 20 years ago called Wild at Heart, sold over a million copies. Well, he doesn't really travel very much to speak. People come to him, ah. you know, a couple of times a year, he'll do these conferences and it's like, he lives in Colorado. So if you want to see him speak, you come to Colorado, but not just anybody can do that, right? Like the, the best band of all time can probably stay in Vegas and you come to Vegas to see them. But, you know, for the most part, if you want your stuff to be seen, you have to go on tour. So, so the point is well taken. I did want to get into chapter 11. I thought this was a very interesting part of your book because you talk about a guy named Mike Werner who was teaching you about how to evaluate material. So he kind of taught you to separate the wheat from the chaff to a certain degree. So overall, just evaluating, you know, what's necessary here. You talk about how, you know, you had some of your books that were so big and you didn't think you could cut anything and then you shrunk it down and it made it even better and you had to go through that process. But in addition to evaluating material, a lesson I took from that chapter, Stephen, was evaluating personal talent. Because I know that there are a lot of people right now, so podcasting is an easy one. How easy is it to buy a microphone, hook it up to a recorder, and then put it out there on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and everywhere else? It's super easy. The barrier to entry is really, really, really low. So what we have now is we literally have millions of crappy podcasts (laughs) from people that should not be talking out loud to anybody. And that's why their audiences stay small. That's why they get frustrated and they quit doing it after three months, four months, that type of a thing. And so part of it, I think, is because people think that just because they can do something that they should, right? Just because you can go up in front of a a group of judges on American Idol and sing doesn't mean you're good at it. So talk to me a little bit about the lesson that Mike Werner taught you in terms of evaluating material, but also how that spans out to just evaluating your overall personal talent level. That's uh, that's a great question. I mean, now evaluating material for that, that's I don't know if that quite relates to this, Kyle, but in that case, it was uh, it actually was my writing partner at the time, a guy named Ron Shusette, who did the original Alien and Total mm-hmm. Recall and stuff like that. And the way it would sort of I learned from him was I would throw like 10 ideas at him. It was just the two of us working and he would reject nine of them right at nah, 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 that's no good. And then he picked the one. And when I and over and over, I would say he was right. That's the one good idea. Why couldn't I pick that one idea? Why was I confused with the other nine? And I think that over time, when you're with somebody that just has an instinct for that, you begin to sort of imbibe it otherwise. Now, talking about podcasting and stuff like that, I, in a way, I think it's good that a lot of people are doing it because the, the wheat will be separated from the chaff as time goes along. But one of the things I've learned in my own career, it took me like almost 30 years from the time I left a job to try to start to write until I had a novel published. Mm -hmm. And so what was going on through all that time? I was doing a lot of shitty writing. You know, I was I was that podcaster that shouldn't have invested in a microphone, you know. But the, the truth is you get better over time. You get better. You know, you were probably a natural right away, Kyle, but a lot of people are not. A lot of people take their time. And in any event, I applaud anybody that tries that, that tries podcasting or something like that. Maybe that's not their exact metier. Maybe they'll shift and find something else, but at least it's brave to put yourself out there. But I want to ask you a question in your own life. Okay. Yeah. Now you were just talking about how you get up in the morning and the first thing you do is you work out whether you don't want to do it or not. Right. 
Was there a moment for you in your life when you sort of realized that that would work for you or did, were you always like that? So, um, I didn't grow up in a militaristic family. I didn't grow up, uh, in a highly disciplined family for anything other than like homework. Like I would get, if I got B's on my report card, I would be grounded. Like, especially if it was uh -huh. a class that, that I could get an A in. Right. But for me, it was actually because, um, when I was younger, I, you know, I was always athletic, but I was very overweight as a kid. I was very uh -huh. active, but my family fed me really awful, terrible food. You know, maybe they didn't know any better. Maybe they hated me. I don't know. But I, I was, I was very, very overweight as a kid. And so I was constantly being made fun of, um, for my weight and around like eighth, ninth grade, it, you know, just like what happens with a lot of boys is you grow upwards. Like in one baseball summer, I had three different pairs of cleats because my feet were growing so uh -huh. fast. Like uh -huh. I had nine or 10 ingrown toenails at a time because my feet were growing faster than my, my toenails. Right. Uh -huh. And so I'm a little bit skinnier. Uh, I'm, you know, getting attention from girls. Like, you know, my athletic friends are, are looking to me for a little bit of that. And uh -huh. then I, I guess I remember Steven, even when I was a little kid, I was really into pro wrestling and, you know, you had Hulk Hogan and the ultimate warrior and macho man, Randy Savage. And these were these, Adonis looking like men. And I remember just looking at the magazines being like, oh man, one of these days, whenever I'm a big kid, like I'm going to have muscles like that too. And so I guess it was always an aspirational identity, uh. but then it kind of turned into this is what disciplined people do. They do hard stuff that no one else is willing to do. And so part of it is competitive. It's like whenever you're asleep, whenever you're hitting the snooze button, I'm up and I'm getting after uh -huh. it. And so it's kind of that inner F you. I'm going to do it regardless of whether you tell me I should or not because I don't work out with anybody. I don't have a trainer telling me what to do. It is all me. So if I don't work out, nobody knows about it except me. And I'm, I'm un unwilling to lead a lifestyle that's going to be accepting of taking three or four weeks off just because I feel like it. Ah, okay. Great answer. Thank you. Well, Hey, I mean, we can keep turning this interview around if you want to interview. <laughs> like I thought this was my show, Steven, but you can ask me, you can ask me whatever you want. You have carte blanche, but I do have another question for you because it actually relates to, to your answer about chapter 11, okay. because in chapter 14, I mean, I mean, again, it took you decades before you were a success as it were, but you know, you talk about people being unwilling to unconditionally like dedicate themselves to their work. Right. And it, it brought up for me that there are a lot of people that, especially in the era we live in now, if they don't ex succeed immediately, they're like, they throw their hands up, like what's going wrong. Like there's another podcaster that, you know, he's like, man, I've been doing this podcast for like six months and it's not taken off. What am I doing wrong? And I'm like a whole six months. Really? <laughs> like, gosh, uh, you know, batten down the hatches, you know, call, you know, stop the presses. This guy's been trying hard for six months. And I think a lot of us have that idea. And I, when I tell people about wanting to, when they want to start a podcast first, the first thing I tell them, I was like, don't, please don't like, we don't need any more. But if you do decide to do that, like, are you willing to do it every single week, releasing one episode a week for three years before you get more than a hundred downloads? Are you willing to do that? Because it might seem foolish during those three years of doing that, but it's putting in the reps and it may, you may end up going viral one day and you may be stuck with a couple of hundred listeners. Are you okay with that? And that's when people start to really evaluate themselves. And that kind of brought up again, the, the unconditionally dedicating yourself to your work. And Steven, if I'm being honest, I got, I got to say, most people are just not willing to do that, right? No, they're not. I mean, and of course that's kind of in our culture these days, particularly recent culture, mm -hmm last 10 years, last 15 years, the idea of instant success, right? Mm -hmm. That's what you hear about. You hear about somebody that produces a, a sex tape and it goes viral or they, you know, they, they do some dance in their bedroom, you know, some right. 14 year old girl does it. And the next thing you know, she has 10 million listeners. I mean, we never had that sort of thing before, before the web, right? Where, mm -hmm. and this sort of, this sort of fantasy that uh, you can succeed overnight and it's just, it's absolutely not true. If I were to say anything, well, I'll tell you a story. This is yeah. a workout story. Um, like I say, I'm a gym person just like you. And a few years ago, I fell off the wagon for like three or four months. Mm. And I was like kind of in despair over that, over myself. You know, what a bum I'd become. I was, and I was talking to a friend of mine, a woman who was also a gym person. She said to me, you know, Steve, she said, the gym for us, this is a lifetime commitment. 
We're going to be doing this when we're 90. So don't feel bad. You fell off the wagon, you're going to get back on. You're probably going to fall off the wagon again three or four years from now. So don't just take it in stride. You're a human being. You're entitled to screw up. This is a lifetime commitment. And that's a great question to ask anybody that wants to start anything, a podcast or, you know, filmmaking, you name it, whatever. Are you, are you in this? Are you committed to this for life? Because if you're not, Joe Rogan is certainly committed to whatever it is. And that's mm -hmm. why he's what he, doing what he's doing. So I think, uh, you know, that the, this idea that there's an instant hack is a real unhealthy thought to have put it. If I had kids, well, the first thing I would do is erase that, delete that from, from their, right. their mind because it's real destructive. Well, I, it is destructive. And, and just to be honest, I struggle with that as well because I will see people that are, in my own humble opinion, not nearly as talented <laughs> at, you know, doing the whole podcast thing, but depending on who they're married to or depending upon what viral moment they had, all of a sudden their audience is half of what mine is in a week. And it took me five years to build like that kind of a thing. And so I, again, it's that competitiveness, but a lot of it's envy. And I have to really check myself and be like, look, this is, this is not destroying them. They don't even know I they're exist. Right. And here I am wasting my time and effort, lamenting the fact that they're where they are and I'm where I am. And so I think it's, it's good to always put yourself in that particular place. But one thing that also uh, brings up for me, Stephen, is in chapter 31, I think the name of the chapter is a lifetime, one hour at a time. And someone brought this up. I can't remember who did it exactly. I'd love to be able to give them them credit, but they were talking about it in terms of Christianity. They were like, oh, it was uh, Dale Partridge. So he's a theologian and author and all these types of things. He runs uh, relearn.org. But he said, it's not how many years you've been a Christian, it's how many hours. And I think about it also in terms of jujitsu. Like I've been training jujitsu for about five years, but how many hours is that? Because I know people that have been training jujitsu for five years that have trained three, four, five times the hours, the amount of time that I've done out. And so like for me, I'm trying to change that paradigm in my brain of like, Stephen, you've been an author for how many years? 50 years. 50 years. trying to be, but, let's put it that way. Right. But that that's the exact point is there are people that have been an author for 50 years that don't have nearly the amount of hours put in. And so I think for all of us, it would be much more beneficial for us and to our, our art or our work that we're producing. If we think about it in terms of hours, not years, does, does that make yes. sense? But let me say this kind of the point I was really trying to make there was let's say you have a dream that uh, a calling that you're driven to do. But you're married, you have a family, you have, you have a job, you have obligations, whatever it is, and you just can't find the time to do, to do it full time. Can you do it one hour a day? And my answer to that is mm -hmm. yes, because as I say, the, the, the muse, the goddess doesn't measure, you know, the, the amount of time that you put in. She measures the commitment. She asks herself, is this person in that one hour really putting her heart and soul into what they're doing? Are they really committed? In that case, the goddess will help us, you know? So I, I, I do think that it's absolutely possible. And for me, for years too, when I would work a full-time job, I would just come in on weekends and do my writing then to the office on weekends, or I'd come home and get in an hour at night, something like that. So it is possible to be a full-time artist, one hour a day, even though it doesn't seem to make sense, but it's true. And another thing, we live in another this. thing I want to say, let me Go throw ahead. this at you too, Kyle. Yeah. Like right now, this is to encourage anybody that has a limited amount of time. Right mm -hmm. now, I'm a full-time writer. I have nothing else that I do. But it turns out that with all the, the things you have to do, correspondence, um, doing a podcast, doing when it all comes down to it, I wind up getting maybe two hours a day that I can actually sit down at the keyboard and work. So, you know, I could have a full-time job and still carve out two hours. So if you're one of those people that can only get a couple of hours a day, you can do it. You know, anything at all, right. you can do it. I think it goes back to aspirational identity, like what we were talking about. And you're very complimentary of Jack Carr. I think you even talked about it in the book where Jack Carr spends a lot of time 
writing, but he also spends a lot of time responding to direct messages, to doing podcasts, to going on interviews, to going on tour, making his face available and his, his attitude available. But if you're just really into his writing, you may think, oh man, I bet he has so much time to write. But if you hear him talk about it, he has to literally peel himself away from his life and go into seclusion to different places in order to get the book done. He has a computer that's separate from his normal computer that doesn't even have access to the internet. Right. So basically he can just write on that laptop and it's very, very important for him. So I think that's a good point, but you made it about halfway into the interview before you mentioned the muse. And I'm glad you did because <laughs> I got some questions about the muse. So I'm going to read a couple of quotes here. So from chapter 40, this is called commit to serving heaven. So here's the quote. The first thing I do when I enter my office each morning is say a prayer to the muse. I say it out loud in dead earnest. And then in chapter 71, you have this quote here. In Alcoholics Anonymous, they call it a higher power. I've never been completely comfortable with that term, but I certainly believe that the material dimension, that's capital M, capital D, material dimension upon which you and I dwell is not the only level of reality that exists. Where do ideas come from? If we're honest, you and I, we have to admit that we don't know except that ideas don't come from us. A song by Tom Waits, a novel from Elizabeth Gilbert, both artists will confess immediately that ideas came to them. So this, I kind of want to break this down a little bit further because obviously we're very open about this. You know, I'm a Christian, you know, I'm all these different things. And so I believe in the Judeo-Christian God. I believe a Middle Eastern Jew, you know, when he was 33 years old, that he was crucified on a Roman cross at the behest of the Jews and that he rose three days later and 2000 years later, here I am talking about him. I believe that with every fiber of my being. So you're, you're not there. You don't necessarily believe in that, but you're not where some people are, where they're completely shut off to things outside the material world. You're not a strict materialist uh, in, in that way. So give me a little bit more in terms of what you think about that next dimension or what that looks like, because a lot of people stop well before that. They, they don't really acknowledge, they just assume the idea came to them because, you know, hey, we used to be monkeys and before that we used to be fish and that idea came to me because I have to survive and that's okay. So I'm just gonna give you a little bit of runway. Let's chat about that some. Okay, that's a great question, Kyle. Now, let me say, talk about the muses themselves in Greek mm -hmm. mythology, what they were. Right. The muses were nine sisters, goddesses, the daughters of Zeus, the king of the gods, and Mnemosyne, which means memory, which is pretty interesting. And each one of the nine muses was in charge of a different art, dance, music, epic poetry, so on and so forth. And the job of the muses was to inspire artists here on, on, the, on the earth, right? And the classic picture that we have today would be like Beethoven at the piano, and there would be mm. this kind of mysterious female force right at his ear, kind of whispering in his ear. So right. that's, that's the way the Greeks thought about it. You know, they sort of anthropomorphized everything. But one of the things you find as, as a writer wherever, or any kind of an artist where every day you're sort of, you're, you're dealing with... Uh, um, what's my next idea? It, let's right. say I start a book. I've got an idea for the opening scene. Where's the next scene coming from? Where's the scene after that coming from? Where's the whole concept going? And you realize pretty soon that these ideas are not coming from you. You're not manufacturing them, particularly mm. when you get into a place like a, the, what you would call the zone where you lose all track of time, you're just working. And when the day is over, the next day you look at the pages and you go, mm -hmm. wow, this is really good. And it's also feels like it's not coming from you. It's like, who put this down there? You know? So the, the idea of saying a prayer to the muse at the start of the day, and I don't think this is incompatible with Christianity or anything like that. It could be, you know, Saint so-and-so or whatever, somebody in heaven is, that you're, you, the artist on this material dimension, are putting yourself at the service of, of something at a higher level. You know, I'm a believer that like the Ninth Symphony existed in some other dimension before Beethoven wrote it, you know? Now, you may not go along with that, Kyle, but that's what I believe. So that's kind of my life is really... Um, trying to, to bring into this material dimension via my fingertips mm -hmm. something that's already out there that wants to be born, that's coming from some, some, other, some other dimension, which I would call a divine dimension, however you want to define it. 
so that's what that's what the muse is to me and uh i always say you know the muse is a is a female it's a goddess right mm -hmm. i'd say that it's the only female in my life that i've ever been true to unconditionally <laughs> and she has always been true to me unconditionally so there's something to it, even though we can't touch it or feel it or taste it or measure it. Yeah, I think that's important. And I want to dig in a little bit further because one thing I jotted down as you were talking is I feel the same way sometimes. Like people ask me, you know, how do I prepare for a podcast and all these different things? And one thing that I tell people is like when my podcast comes out, especially the ones where I'm just by myself, I'm as excited to listen to it as they are because I'm not sure what I said. Uh -huh. Because like, I, I don't ma like transcribe my podcast. I put bullet points on a sheet of paper and I go for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour and a half. And like, I'm, I'm excited to hear what I said too. And every now and then I'm disappointed because I, I, I misspoke or I said a word incorrectly or, or, or something like that. I said something I, I didn't mean to say, but it's almost like whenever you're, you're sifting through ideas in your head is you're trying to make sense of the energy in your brain. You're trying to make sense of what that means. And everybody knows that feeling when you have an idea and then you lose it, mm. you feel like you've lost something tangible. Yes. Like you feel like you've lost your watch or you lost your phone. I mean, do you kind of feel that way? Because whenever I miss an idea, I, I like chastise myself like I misplaced my wallet. Yeah, exactly. In fact, I'm a, I always sleep, you know, with my phone, you know, right next to me. Right. Because when I have an idea in the middle of the night and I say, and it's just like a dream, right? You always say to yourself, well, I'll remember that. There's no way I'm going to forget that. And right. then in the morning you wake up, it's completely gone, you know? Yeah. But so I'm always happy when I write it down or I record it. And then I go, it's like some friend is giving me an idea. It's like, where did that? I forgot about it already. Right. But uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I text myself constantly. Uh -huh. And so like, if I get an idea while I'm driving, I will turn on voice memos and I, it's usually about a podcast. It's like, Oh, I want to make sure I make that point. Like, and it'll just pop into my head or it'll be kind of like a combination or a coalescence of a bunch of other people's ideas, but it's going to be said differently through my face. And so like, this is how I would say it kind of a thing. Uh, but I do want to kind of circle back to, to kind of what you were talking about. So a Man at Arms is one of the best fiction books I've ever read. I believe I gave it the award for for best fiction book or most entertaining book last year. It is it is absolutely fantastic. You've written it's right there in front of you. You sent me a bunch of copies. That's what we talked about in the last episode, guys. I'll make sure that's in the show notes so you can check out that book as well. But without giving too much away, one of the center points of that book, which has so many lessons in it, you know, it has lessons about, you know, masculine strength and um, overcoming even personal stoicism. And there, there's so many great lessons you can pull from that book, a fiction book of all things. But you seem to have, as a manner of speaking within that book, a deep reverence for scripture. And I, by that, I mean the scripture of the Bible, right? So we're, we're talking old Testament, like, like those types of things. And so you're a guy that if you follow you on social media, all that, like you'll quote an ancient stoic, you'll, you'll quote a Greek philosopher, you'll quote the quote, the Bhagavad Vita, like you, you'll quote all these different things, but that book is dripping with reverence for a book that is very exclusive in its worldview. Because if you read that book cover to cover and understand it theologically, it doesn't give room for all these other ways. Like Jesus either lived and was resurrected or he didn't. There, there's no nuance as smart, dumb people like to say. There's no in between. That is either a fact or it's not. So talk to me a little bit more about that because even for someone who maybe doesn't purport to have a strictly Christian worldview, right? A, a way of looking at things. You seem to understand how unbelievably important the Bible is, correct? Well, I'll say this, like when, uh, when I was at my lowest ebb in my life, mm -hmm. um, I would try to read to try to, you know, help me. Right. And I found that almost everything I read, even really good books, didn't work for me. It was like I was a starving man and they were feeding me sand. But one of the things that did work for me was the King James Bible. Not the other translations, which, uh, but for that old school, great stuff. And I found that that certain verses would would bring me to tears immediately, you know? And I felt like I couldn't put my finger on why, but I thought, Whoever put this on paper or wherever this came from, it's coming from a really, really deep place. It's coming from a place that understands 
how desperate a human being can be when they're lost, you know? Mm -hmm. And this is like pure mountain spring water coming to me. So I've always had a great reverence for that, along with other scriptures and along with Shakespeare and other really, really great stuff. So um, uh, do you want me to talk a little bit about the origins of this book, A Man in Arms? Or, oh, or, absolutely. Like, I mean, we, we got into it a lot in, in the in the last one, but I, I think that's very important, especially to what we're talking about now. Let's go. OK, this may be I mean, if uh, you can always edit this out. Kyle, oh, no, no, no. We're not. Let, let's keep this going. But uh, a man at arms takes place, you know, about, you know, uh, 20 years after the crucifixion mm -hmm. in Judea, in that world where Rome was uh, the dominant force. So how this book kind of started for me. Um, and bear with me, you guys, on this, was uh, my niece was getting married, and she asked me to officiate at it. Turns out my brother, her dad, had already married them, but uh, I was going to do it in a public form. So I went to the Book of Common Prayer, and I was looking you know, for various quotes that I could use in whatever I was going to say. And I found that all of the quotes that I pulled out came from the same place, came from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, first mm -hmm. Corinthians, um, you know, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then mm -hmm. face to face. And when I was a child, I thought as a child, I speak as a child, et cetera, et cetera, those things. So at some point, I know I'm kind of wandering here and it's, I'm no, not going no, to this is good. Go. But I thought to myself, this is now me as a writer thinking about an idea for a book. I thought that letter, Paul's letter to the, to the Christian community at Corinth, which is what it was, that was a real letter. Mm -hmm. He really wrote it. Paul, you know, the apostle really wrote it. And from the Roman point of view, dominating the world as they were, that letter was like an atomic bomb. Mm -hmm. Because if it got out around to all of the other communities, it was going to be the overthrow of Rome because spiritual, and in fact, it was. In fact, right, there was Christian communities in Rome itself. And eventually when Rome fell, that's where now the Pope is, is there. So in any event, I just thought Rome, learning about this letter, would have to try to stop it. And I thought, there's a story right there. A courier delivering this letter, bad guys trying to stop it, and maybe one hero trying to defend it. Anyway, I'm sorry, I kind of blathered on about that. But that's how Scripture... Uh, really worked to give this story a real, real meat. I mean, when mm -hmm. you talk about what's in that letter, it isn't just, hey, how you doing? What's happening? It's, you know, real explosive stuff about love. It's all about love, right? Right. The greatest, for now abide us these three, faith, hope, and charity, but the greatest of these is charity. That's powerful stuff. It's absolutely powerful. And Stephen, from an apologetics, from a Christian apologetics point of view, the way that scripture was passed on in the first, second, and third century, and the way Christianity was able to withstand the predations of, of the Roman magistrates and things like that, that is one of the reasons that we can point to as to the importance of the message, but also to the longevity and truthfulness of the message, because you had so many people that were willing to quietly and calmly walk to their desks that they knew were going to be brutal. And at that time, it wasn't because of what they believed, you know, air quotes, because here we are 2000 years later. It's like, oh, do you believe that? It was because of what these people saw. Because uh, we have, you know, from the New Testament, we see that there Jesus appeared after his resurrection to a group of 500 people. And so these people were going around not saying, hey, I believe this. I believe this. I believe this. You should believe it, too. It's like, you won't believe what I saw. You won't believe what I saw. And that carried them through those early years, like the absolute unbelievable persecution that they suffered. But it also kind of goes back to, it's interesting for you to say that in, in times of, uh, in low times and hard times for you in your life, you found comfort in the King James, King James Bible uh, and in that translation and some of the things therein. Now, as you were saying that, you were also saying that you you couldn't really you figure out why. Like, why was this so comforting? You just knew that it was. It was instinctively you knew that it was. My contention, Stephen, would be that was God calling you closer to him. That was God saying to you, communicating to you through his word, saying, Stephen, I'm here. I'm the source of peace. 
I am the source of all the things that are good in this world. The only reason you know why you're in a bad spot is because I gave you a moral law with which to differentiate between good things and evil things. So as you think further about that time period in your life, are you open to the fact that that may have been the Judeo-Christian God basically saying, Stephen, I'm here, come closer to me? It, it certainly could be. I would not reject that, Kyle. On the other, on the other hand, it could also be simply the great poetry of of the stuff, and of mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the things that always would bring me to tears is um, Ruth's speech to Naomi, which mm -hmm. is really not any sort of Christian thing or any kind of uh, you know, it's just a, a statement of love, you know. Um, you know, entreat me not to leave thee or to refrain from following after thee, for whither mm -hmm. thou goest, I will go, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's, a, that's a, just an incredible statement of, of uh, you know, of love between two people, two women, in fact, you know, not lesbian love, but, you know, sure. a bond between them that where, where you go, I will go, and, and not even death itself can part us. So that, that touched me on, on that level because at that time for me, there was no indication in my life that any force or any other human being, you know, gave a damn about me. So anyway, uh, you know, I won't dispute your uh, point of view there, Kyle, but I think it was, it was, it was also, uh, on, on just the human level, a lot of the stuff that was, that was, that, that meant a lot to me. Well, and that's a good point as well with, when you read scripture, like some scripture is historical attestation as to what happened during a particular time to a particular people. Some of it is poetry. Some of it is, uh, erotic. Like there, there are a lot of different types of yeah. styles in the Bible. Jesus spoke in parables a lot. So if you read it just as fiction or nonfiction or history in total, you're not really going to hit it. And, and I'll, I'll kind of put a bow on it with this. Cause I want to move on and ask you a few more questions before we get you out of here. So you obviously have a deep reverence for the scripture. Your reverence for the scripture is deeper than some Christians that I know. Um, it just in the, the fact that you've internalized a lot of it to where you can quote it. Cause even a lot of Christians can't quote, you know, this book that they purport to say is, is, you know, the, the word of God, but I would love to see you in, in my prayer for you. And I have prayed for you is to move from reverence to belief and, and not just belief in this squishy way. Like, Oh, I believe in a thing called love. I believe in this. I believe in whatever, like this kind of a ethereal thing that it doesn't have any tangible meat to it. But, also for you to pray to Jesus as if he was actually resurrected, as if he actually was sent to die here for you and for your sins to give you a pathway to the Father. That would be my encouragement to you. And I'm not going to put you on the spot and say, are you going to do that? I'm going to check in with you later on today. But I, I know that you're you're an amenable guy to those types of promptings. And so that's one thing that I just wanted to leave you with is to pray to him as if he were there and see if he answers. Is that fair? Well, I, I appreciate that thought, Kyle. And okay, fair enough. As a, as a good Jew, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we'll move off of that. And I appreciate you letting us go down that rabbit hole. Uh, a couple more things from your book that I found to be very, very interesting. Um, and it applies to a lot of other things in the book. Chapter 55 of the book, you talk about self-reinforcement. Now, that is much different than self-belief and you can do it and, you know, just find the motivation and, you know, be your own whatever. Like, it was very, very tangible. So talk to us a little bit more about self-reinforcement. Well, we know what, reinf reinf let me define rein reinforcement first. Mm -hmm. It's like if you were at the gym, you were training at the gym and you had a trainer and you were doing squats and you did them exactly the way he wanted you to do them or you moved to a new weight or whatever it was, mm -hmm. heavier your weight for that day, your trainer would say to you, Kyle, that's great, man. Keep it up. I, you were really getting into your butt on that one. You were really stretching the way I wanted. I saw your feet flat on the floor. I saw your knees right in line with your hips. You really, that was great, right? That's reinforcement, right? And it encouraged you, a coach, a teacher, a mentor, or whatever. In fact, this podcast is kind of a form of reinforcement for a lot sure. of people. But there's a difference between reinforcement and self-reinforcement. And self-reinforcement self, -re and self -re is a lot harder to do. One of the things I say in the book is that self, the ability to self-reinforce is more important than talent in terms of artists or something. So like for me, I'm going to pick this up again. Here, I'm alone. I've got just me and this thing. At the end of the day, I have to, and I literally do, reinforce myself for what I did that day. 
Just like I, if I had a trainer, if I had a coach, I have a mentor. I have to have that internal self-talk that, that keeps me motivated because you will never make it over the long haul without reinforcement of some kind. Nobody will, right? An army, Napoleon's army invading Russia is not going to get there unless, you know, the food comes in and, the re, and you know, the encouragement comes in and so on and so forth. So it's, it's a habit. They don't teach you this in school, you know? They don't mm. t- teach you what self-talk is and that kind of thing. And, but I will definitely take moments and reinforce myself every day to tell myself, you know, good job, keep it up, et cetera, et cetera. And whatever, whatever way works for you, for the individual, it's very, very important to do. It's a missing thing that lets that without it, you're struggling. Well, let's talk a little bit more about self-talk because, and I've said this before and people, people that don't know me, they, they, they just can't imagine this being true. I'm so unbelievably pessimistic. Okay. I, that's just kind of who I am. That's, that's a bit of my wiring. If you heard my self-talk, you would be astonished at how negative it is. Like part of my, <laughs> so I have an error for one second. Go ahead. Go ahead. Say, that's self-talk. That's resistance. That's capital R resistance. That's not you. That's this force called resistance. So in any event, I've got that too all the time. Right. Keep going. I'm sorry. Well, no, so no, that that's great. So part of the thing for me is I use that as fuel. So this is going to strike people as inappropriate and strike people as rude and mean and and non-Christian and and, and r- all those things, right? So I have an Airdyne bike. All right. So that's one of those bikes that it's, you know, it's arms and the legs and it's really, really hard to do. It's one of the 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 rogue ones. It's really, really uh robust. And I put duct tape on the fan part of it. So it's not, you know, cooling me off as I'm doing it just to make it worse for me. Right. Uh-huh. Well, on that black duct tape, Stephen, I wrote DBAP, D-B-A-P, which means don't be a pussy. Because uh-huh. the reason why I do that is whenever I'm up here and I'm going and I'm going, and I'm going, and I'm going and I get tired and my head starts to look down and oh, there's so much sweat dripping off me right there in my field of vision is DBAP. And that's what I tell myself. And again, some people be like, oh, that's so negative. You shouldn't do that. Like that's, that's like negative reinforcement. But for me, I'm like, no, 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 that is fuel because the reason I'm on this bike to begin with this demonic bike to begin with is because I want to be better. I want to be more resilient. And so I know that that's probably not the healthiest thing in the world, Steven, but like from your perspective, is that okay to kind of have some of that, like that gritty, almost angry self-talk to if, as long as it propels you to something positive. I think it's great. That is self-reinforcement by definition. Okay. You know, if that, if you had a trainer there, he'd be standing in your ear and putting that into your ear, right? If you had a coach, your football coach, your basketball coach, whatever, whatever it was, as you were doing wind sprints, right? Mm -hmm. That's what he's telling you. Don't be a pussy. Keep going, keep going, keep going. And so that is what self-reinforcement is by definition. Yeah. And, and guys, yeah, you're on, you're onto something here. When it's like, do that for yourself guys. And I know some people, they need a trainer. They literally need a coach. Like that's something about them. They just don't have that extra level. But if you can guys, if you can be your own trainer, if you can be your own coach, like that's, that's a intellectual exercise. Cause you need to make sure you're doing things that are okay for you and your frame and your age and all those different things. But also it's going to save you money because you're not paying a trainer to do it. It's going to save you time because you're not going to have to go meet them to do this, that, or the other thing. Uh, but, but anyway, that's great. And guys, there, there's way more meat on the bone. Even in this short book, there were a lot of stories in there, uh, that we didn't have time to really get to. There were a lot of other topics, but those are things that I just wanted to pull out to at least make it enticing for those men. But I want to know what you got coming up for the future, because I know you got other projects in mind. I know you're you're always writing. So you've got fiction and nonfiction both going for me personally. I want to follow up to a man at arms, right? And so if you release another fiction book and it's not a follow up to where I can know what happened to tell I'm going to be so mad at you, Stephen. but <laughs> to give me an idea of what we can expect for the future from you. Well, I've got two, two books, two big books that are going right. One of them is the next book about tell the next book about, let's go. At arms. You know, I'm, right. So I'm right in the middle of that right now and having to self-reinforce quite a bit. Um, and another book that's done and it will be coming out around Christmas time is it's sort of uh, it, it's autobiographical. Mm. It's, you know, anybody who's read my books, The War of Art or other books like that, I, I allude to certain 
periods in my life, you know, when I was driving trucks or I was working on oil fields or I was in Hollywood or whatever, but I've never really written about that straight out, you know? And so I thought maybe it's time for me to do that. So this is a, another, this is a book that's kind of a, sort of a writer's journey telling all the parts that you usually don't tell. Well, I'm excited to read that as well. And you know, you always have a straight pathway to our audience whenever all you right, release something back. new. Uh, but as for now, that is all for me. Is there anything you want to get off your chest? Um, I'm sure I'll think of it later, Kyle, but right now, no, I, uh, I just want to say, you know, thanks for having me. And, uh, I, I hope what our conversation has been helpful to, uh, to your, to your listeners here. It certainly has been to me. I'm sure it is for them as well. Stephen Pressfield, thank you for coming back on Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. All right. Thanks, Kyle. Till next time. There you go, guys. I hope you enjoyed the third appearance of Stephen Pressfield on our show. But before we let you go, we are going to do a quick resilience boost at Undaunted Life. Our mission is equipping men to push back darkness with content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. So I've got links to all the books that we talked about on this particular podcast. So you can go to Amazon and pick up copies of those. I've also got a link to Stephen Pressfield's website and also to his YouTube channel. You guys should check all of that out. All right, guys. Thanks so much for listening to the show. We do appreciate it. Wherever you're listening to this, please subscribe, rate, and leave us a positive five-star review. If you want to come speak live at your event or on your podcast, just shoot me an email to info at undaunted.life. That's I-N-F-O at undaunted.life. You can follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook and check out our website for everything else, including how to donate to keep more content like this coming your way. Just go to www.undaunted.life. And as always, we want to thank the band August Burns Red for allowing us to use their music for our content. The music on this podcast is their song Cutting the Ties, which is off their 10th anniversary re-recording of their album Leveler. The links are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, Keep pushing back darkness. Keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. Keep seeking the Lion of Judah. <laughs>